Well, <clears throat> this is our seventh message in our sermon series, The Beginning, as we're going through the book of Genesis. And today we're going to be talking about the sixth and final day of the creation covered in Genesis 1, 24 through 31. And um, day seven was not a creative work. Day seven was a day of rest. But this is so this is the last day of the creative work. And as a quick recap of the main themes thus far as we've gone through this series, again, you can go back and watch every single one of these on our Facebook page or on um, my, our YouTube that has all of the sermons. Um, but the, from the creation, it starts as what I said earlier, in the beginning God, which tells us that God was there in the very beginning. And I've, I've kept this up all um, the entire time we've been together, seventh, seventh series that God, everything in creation is in this box, and God is outside of that box and is not bound by anything within that box. Not, not time, not, not anything. He doesn't have parents because he created parents, all that stuff. He's outside of creation. And he always was. And from the beginning, God has everything perfectly planned out for all of creation. We're seeing that happen as in his creative work. And, and as we've covered these days, we've seen how it's been perfectly planned out all the way up into this part. And it, it doesn't stop here. It continues. Day one, creation of light and darkness and separating light and darkness and calling it day and night. Giving them both purposes. Day has a purpose. Night has a purpose. They both have purpose. Light has purpose. Darkness has purpose. Then on day two, God separated the waters below from the waters above. Creating the sky, which we call firmament. Day three, God separated the waters below and made seas. And he made all the vegetation and produced themselves through their own seed. Then on day four, God created all the great lights that we see in the skies, the, the, uh, in, within the firmaments, the, the sun, the moon, the stars, everything except the clouds, as we will explore. Again, that's not until Genesis 6 where we get clouds with the, after rain came for the first time. Day five, all of the sea life and the flying creatures, which brings us uh, to today, the final day of God's creative work, day six. So let's go ahead and begin reading Genesis chapter one, verses 24 through 31. I said, I told Cindy, sorry, I told Cindy that her finger is going to be sore from all of the pictures and slides for today. So um, everyone say a quick prayer for Cindy as she's back there. Then God said, let the earth produce every sort of animal, each producing offspring of the same kind, livestock, small animals that scurry along the ground, and wild animals. And that is what happened. God made all sorts of wild animals, livestock, small animals, which are each able to produce offspring of the same kind, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the sea and the birds of the sky, the livestock and all the animals on the earth and the small animals that scurry along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and said, be fruitful, and multiply, fill the earth and govern it. Reign over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and the animals that scurry on the ground, uh, along the ground. Then God said, look, I have given you every seed bearing plant throughout the earth and all the fruit trees for your food. And I have given every green plant as food for all the wild animals and the birds in the sky and the small animals that scurry along the ground. Everything that has life. And that is what happened. Then God looked over all he had made and he saw that it was very good. And evening passed and morning came, marking the sixth day. I'll be spending a lot more time in the next few weeks on God's creation of man, but I wanted to throw that in there because it's a part of day six creation, but I'm not going to really focus a whole lot on God's creation of man. The next few weeks we'll cover that, but I wanted to let you guys know that. We see that on day six that God turns his attention on all of the land-based animals, and God made all the land uh, animals according to their kind. We keep, continue to hear that, from big to small. This would include like bugs, and that when he talks about scurry, things that scurry, things like that, bugs, everything. Every land-based animal. And I was just thinking when I was reading this and studying, what would it have been like to be those birds from, that were created the day before and that are nesting in the trees? 
oh, I got my nest, I'm ready to go, and then all of a sudden God speaks, and then all of these animals underneath the tree start popping up and start running around, causing commotion, like, whoa, what are we doing here? You know, all these different things. What would it have been like to be those birds, like, oh, what is happening? Now we got these guys, but it would have been amazing to experience that. But I think it's very important for us to have an understanding as we hear this word kind constantly. So what does it mean by kind? Because I, I don't think God had to create every single animal that we see on this day. And I'll explain that as we go through this. Often people are confused thinking that a, a species is a kind. But this isn't necessarily so. A species is a man-made term used in modern classification systems. Okay, I have this. Maybe if you remember high school, maybe junior high, I can't remember. Uh, classification, hierarchy of the animal class. Okay, and so um, you, you see the, all these different families and, and categories that they used to um, include these animals into, or that they still include these animals into. All right, so where does, when God says kind, where does it fall into? All right. Well, God says the, the, the Bible uses this term kind, and the Bible uses it, it's a Hebrew word, min, M-I-N, and is found when God creates plants and animals. He says, I'm going to create them based on their kind, and they're going to reproduce based on their kind, according to their kind. So I would put kind in the classification of family. You can go to the next slide, uh, Cindy, please. And you can see that in, within a family on these slides behind me, of families, they can reproduce amongst themselves, okay? And again, this word kind is used again in Genesis 6 when it illustrates, when, when God instructs Noah to take two of every kind of animal, okay? Not every species, okay? But every kind of animal. So it's important for us to understand that, what he's talking about. As God told Noah to take these kinds of animals onto the ark, and then he commanded the kinds to reproduce after the flood. But again, I'm going to talk a little about the flood today because it's connected, but we're going to have much more on it in future weeks. The text infers that plants and animals were created to reproduce within the boundaries of, again, their family or kinds. This is still what we see today. There's evidence of this everywhere. So this is the, one of the, first chap this is the first chapter of the Bible, and there's still evidence of the truth of it today to us. Okay? This, uh, we, we, I've, I've never heard a report yet and I will never, of new dats walking around. It's a dog and a cat mix. Have you? I haven't. Have you guys had any howls around? Horses and cows mixed together? Nope, I haven't either. See, canines can breed within their family. Okay? You can have a wolf, a dingo, a coyote, or domestic dog, and they can, all, they can all still interbreed between each other and have offspring. Because they're in the same family or kind. Okay? And all of the variations that you get from those, interbreeding and DNA and genetics, is how we get all of our different types of breeds of dogs. Right? You have different animals and you have them breed together that are of the same kind and you get different variations of animals. From within that kind. It's still a dog. A wolf and a coyote is still a type of dog. Right? It's still a canine. It's in that family. Same would be true for felines. Cats, jaguars, leopards, pumas, tigers, lions. All these different things. And you can see that. If you go to different zoos, you'll see a, a liger. A lion and a tiger mixture. Okay? You'll see all these different things. The same with horses. Mules, donkeys, zebras, horses. Clydesdales, Belgiums, all these different breeds of different types of horses. They can all breed together, but they still make a type of horse. Okay? So, God's word says that land creatures were created with the ability to make their own kind. Again, there has never been any fossil evidence or visual evidence to back species jumping from species to species. Cats and dogs can't do it, okay? Horses and gorillas can't breed together and make different animals, okay? It, it's only within their kind, as God stated that. And there's never been any fossils of halfway animals changing from one species to another species. Or there's never been any human 
visual evidence of seeing an animal be born that's changing into another species. We've never seen it. And there's no fossil record of it either to be seen. Okay? Some of these creatures we see in our zoos today, I think I have a picture of some zoo animals. Zoos today were created on day six. Some of these animals were, some were not. Some of them were created out of God's original creation and then them having breeding within their own kind. And we get some of the animals we have today were some of the offspring of, of these animals breeding within their kind, within their families. So some of these animals were created at the beginning, but some were not. While other creatures that we don't see today were created in the very beginning, like the woolly mammoth. Okay? Clearly, it's the great-great-granddad of the elephants that we have today. Right? So this probably would be the predated one, one of the earliest ones to be created. And what we have now are from different types of breeding and variations between the elephant race. Okay, the elephant family. Or how about this sucker? Glad that he's not around. Okay, the saber-toothed tiger no longer lives, but clearly is part of that feline uh, family. Okay, and is no longer here today. So there are some animals that God created that are no longer here, but they fit within a family of kind that God talks about. Now, what about those creatures that we call dinosaurs? Let's get to the, let's get to the juice here. Were they created on this day? Certainly. They are land animals, and God made all land animals on this day. And they had to have been created on day six, or God's word is not truth. Okay, see, this is the point of my whole sermon today, is that, that if God said it, and if, it, if he said one thing, you have to believe what God said. It's all about having a biblical worldview and not a secular worldview. So if God said all the land-based animals are created on day six, you have to believe that dinosaurs are created on day six. Otherwise, why do you believe anything in the Bible if you can't believe that truth? How, do you, how can you believe? How can you believe that God can forgive you of your sins and change you and save you for all of eternity if you can't believe that God said all land-based animals were made on day six and you can't believe that truth? It's either believe some, or believe all, or you, you pick and choose what you believe, and it makes the Bible really void. It's either all truth, and God's not a liar, or it is truth. Okay? I think I said that backwards. God is truth, and the Bible is truth, or he's a liar, and it's not truth. You have to make that choice for yourself. Okay, so God's word is truth. I'm, I, I believe God's word is truth, so maybe... You're like me, and you believe in, you believe in God. I believe in God, but you can never figure out the whole dinosaur connection. How in the world could that possibly fit together within God's creation account? It seems like a mystery, and it doesn't fit into His creation. And 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 if you take what science tells us, the only way that dinosaurs could fit into the creation account is if God had created them before He created man. And then all of a sudden, God was like, I made a mistake and I messed up. These suckers are not controllable. I need to wipe them out and kill them all. And now I'm going to make man and all the, all the good creation that I have. Logically, if you, if you try to mix science with what science tells us about dinosaurs and what God's word says, that's the only logical explanation you can come up with. That God made dinosaurs way before everything else. And then he said, you know what? They're not going to work with men. I messed up. And I'm going to kill them all off. And now I'm going to make man. I'm going to do a better creation. Church. That's garbage. Absolute garbage. Something that we do to try to rationalize to mix in secular worldview with biblical worldview. Okay. Does that sound like the evidence that God has, has given us? That he would do something like that? It, it, absolutely not. Because... God tells us, number one, what we just read, that he creates all land-based animals. Okay, so that means that all dinosaurs would have been created on day six. Also, does God make mistakes? Would God create dinosaurs and then be like, ah, messed up. Get them out of there. They won't work with humans. Sorry, my mistake. No, because on every day of creation, God said what? It is good. Right? My creation is good. I, I, this is good. This process is good. I've done good. This work is good. 
Okay, so that would imply that God messed up with dinosaurs. And he didn't. Okay, we need to develop a biblical worldview where we, where we take God's word and we know that God's word is truth. And then we take the things from the outside this world, that what the secular world tells us, and we say, okay, God's word is truth. How does this secular worldview match up with what God says is truth? And if it doesn't line up with God's word, then it's probably the thing that's wrong. Okay? Or we can dive a little bit deeper to see that maybe they do connect and maybe we just don't understand. Okay? But for now, I, I would venture to guess that most of that secular stuff is not of God. It's not the truth. Some of you might be saying, but, Pastor Zach, the creation account doesn't line up with science. Well, uh, who says it doesn't? That would be my, uh, my question to you. Is who says it doesn't? It just depends on what science source you look at. Who's giving you the evidence? Science from men who are, are never wrong and always accurate on all of their findings. They're always accurate. I'm being sarcastic. Okay? They can't even get the weather right. Okay? I can't tell you how often science is wrong of their ac uh, within their accuracy. Or do we believe we get our science information from the creator of all things who made all things and made science and is the, the study of science to point back to him as the creator? Where do, we, where do we want to get our evidence from? But Pastor Zach, there's no mention of dinosaurs anywhere in the Bible. And wouldn't, the, wouldn't they eat all the people wouldn't Adam and Eve be attacked and eaten by all these dinosaurs? And I would say yes, if you get all your information from Jurassic Park. If you think Jurassic Park is, is that's where you're getting all of your evidence for dinosaurs, or, or, or from what are, even what we got in our old school books growing up. See, the secular world is literally guessing at what dinosaurs were like, right? I mean, do we all under, we can all wrap our heads around it. They're finding bones in the ground thinking they're placing them together in a proper order, and they're putting them up in museums, and then they're saying, now, what would this dinosaur have been like? Huh. Well, I think he probably would have, look at this, he probably ate, 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 uh, ate other dinosaurs. And he probably was a hunter. Look at him. I mean, look at his, look at his, his talons. Have you ever seen a turkey talon? I mean, if, if we take that for in our own mind, turkeys are the most vicious creatures in the history of mankind. Those suckers will, will claw your eyeballs out, right? No, it's a dumb bird. We eat every Thanksgiving, right? But that's what scientists are doing. They're taking bones. They're like, let me guess at what this dinosaur was like from me seeing their bones. Because if you ever go to the Ark Encounter, which I highly encourage everyone to go to the Ark Encounter in the Creation Museum over in Cincinnati area, if you go over to those places, they, they say one, one statement constantly all the time. For anyone that tells you anything about dinosaurs or millions and millions of years, it's this. Were you there? Were you there? So we make all these uh, assumptions of what dinosaurs were like. And I would say, were you there to witness, be an eyewitness account of what a dinosaur was like? However many thousands of years back. Were you there? See, with a biblical worldview, if you continue to read God's word and be like, okay, so let me take the secular worldview and, and match it up with the biblical worldview. We get a revelation from God about animals. Okay, from what we just read this morning. Here's the first one. What did God say animals ate? Verse 29 through 30. Animals eat every fruit and seed-bearing fruit and green plants. Animals are vegetarians. God made animals to be vegetarians. There's not a single animal that he created that was a carnivore roaming on the earth when he first created them. And by the way, we were supposed to be vegetarians as well. We were meant to eat seed-bearing fruits. That was our diet. It was supposed to be. Okay? But things changed, which we're going to get into. Okay? So all animals were created to be vegetarians. And so were we. Okay, so let's just, let's just talk about one dinosaur that everyone is, is super familiar with. Go ahead, the next picture. There is the big bad T-Rex. Okay? The scientists tell us that this is the alpha predator. The, I mean, the king of the hill. I mean, he's the one that be fearful of. Okay, I mean, he is, if he ever comes stomping through here, we're all dead, right? That's how science tells us, uh, tells us all about him, the king predator. I want you just to look at him. We're talking about a perfect creator, right? A perfect creator, God who is perfect at creating things. 
Do you see those nubs that he has for arms? Would you ever want to get in a fight with a guy with no arms? If I had to fight anybody, I'm going to fight a guy with no arms. Okay, like if I ever, like if I have to fight for my life, I want to go against someone with no arms, right? Because I have, I have better agilities, I have better things I can do if someone has little nubby arms. Okay, this is the, this is the big bad predator that God created to, to dominate our world and to be this massive hunter, but he has little nubby arms. Is it perhaps maybe because he's not actually created to be a hunter and to destroy things. Well, he's got, he's got this huge jaw with sharp teeth. And he's like those teeth and everything were made to just shred flesh and to kill everything. Were they? Or maybe that he has those big claws on his bottom of his feet because like chickens or like, like turkeys and stuff, they take their claws and scrape the ground to dig up different things from the ground. Or maybe he's got those... That huge jaw because he won and, and he's so lopsided where he's leaning forward. I, I don't know how these dinosaurs don't st- fall on their faces every time they walk. Okay, because they're so lop with that humongous head. Perhaps his 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 that that body is meant to like go on the ground and eat things on the ground. Not to chase animals and eat animals, but to just eat certain things on the ground. Now, how about this? Maybe this is actually what T-Rex was supposed to be eating. Melons. Big old watermelons. He's got that gigantic mouth to open and, and teeth, huge sharp teeth to puncture huge melons and to crush it. And he's got these little bitty armies so he can hold the melons and eat it. Now to me that makes more sense. I know it's a cartoon picture, but for me that makes way more sense than him chasing around animals and somehow being the king of the world, the king apex predator. Now that's just me. And that's just using logic. Remember, God gave us the ability, he gave us as mankind the ability to rule over all of land creatures. Okay, to have dominion over. In contrast, plants and animals in verse 11, 20, and 24 where God said, let the plants, the earth, bring forth all of the vegetation. And then he says when he created the sea life, the sea creatures, let all the waters bring forth all of the sea life. Now God says, let us, meaning the triune God... Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Whereas God has used existing substances on earth and water to create the other things, he came to this new creation of mankind and from the dust of the earth. He created us to form our bodies and then he additionally breathed life into our lungs through his breath. There is a great difference between man and beast. There's a huge difference between us and and the animals that God created, and the life that God created other than humankind. Only man was created in God's image. We were the only ones created in God's image, and only man is granted self-awareness, immortality through Jesus Christ, spirituality. We were given the ability to have a relationship with God the Father, where animals don't have that relationship with God the Father. Logical analysis. We can logically come to conclusions like, T-Rex was not an apex predator to eat animals and to be the fiercest guy out there. We also have the ability to have freedom of choice. Yes, animals make decisions, but their decisions are all instinctual. All for their own safety and good. Man, on the other hand, has has the complete freedom of choice. We can decide to go either way, to go towards good and to be obedient to God, or to to go towards evil and to be rebellious against God. So God made us above the animal kingdom to rule over them. This would imply that nothing was out to hunt Adam and Eve when God created them. Nothing. I know know that's so hard because we always say, there's no way that dinosaurs could have been in the garden. Because if dinosaurs were in the garden, they would have eaten Adam and Eve and all of their kids. And that would have worked out. You know what? Why is it always that dinosaurs couldn't have been in the garden, but we're okay with Adam laying next to a lion? Or a tiger or a bear. You ever think about that? Everyone's like, no way dinosaurs can be in the garden. They would have destroyed all mankind. But yet, we're okay with him laying with lions and tigers. And saber-toothed tigers and all these different things. Like, we're okay with that analysis. But according to God's word, nothing was out to hunt man. Because man had dominion over the animals. God gave that to him. Plus, they were all vegetarians. In addition... Death had not entered into the world because sin had not happened yet. Romans 5, 12. When Adam sinned, 
sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone for everyone's sin. And that includes all of God's creation. So before Adam had sinned, there was no death whatsoever. Okay, no, no blood, no, no blood was spilled, no death whatsoever had taken place. God didn't create carnivores to live on the land. Okay, Pastor Zach, but with creatures this big, I'm, I, I'm, I'm speaking for you. Okay, I'm trying to answer your questions without having you raise your hand. Okay, but with creatures this big, don't you think that we would have heard more about these creatures when we read the Bible? I, there's no mention of them within the Bible. First, let me fill you in on a little secret. Not all dinosaurs are ginormous. They're not all the huge, massive things that we, we see in the movies or we see in the museums. Those are the, those are the big ones. Scientists estimate that many dinosaurs were just the size of dogs. Many, many dinosaur species were the size of dogs. But, Pastor Zach, why don't we read about these creatures in the Bible? I've never seen the word dinosaur mentioned in the Bible when I read it. Well, the first thing we need to understand is that the word dinosaur was not coined until 1841. Was not invented. Dinosaur was not invented until 1841 by Sir Richard Owen, who is like a pioneer paleontologist of his time. The text of the Bible, in case you didn't know this, the Bible texts that you read are 6,000 years old. I mean, that's old. And the word dinosaur wasn't created until 1841. That's 183 years, okay? O only 183 years that the word dinosaur has been in existence. And it uses two Greek words that mean terrible lizard to describe the fossils and the bones and the teeth that Sir Owen was discovering in the soil. See, paleontologists didn't even really begin excavating dinosaur bones or searching for them at all until the 1800s. Okay, so like, I just want you to, like, before the 1800s, the bones would just be under the ground, and when they came across them, you know what they actually thought they were? They actually thought they were the big bones of the giants that used to roam the earth in the Old Testament that we read about in Canaan and all those areas. So that's where they thought all the big bones actually were. Okay, so let me just make sure you wrap your head around this, this whole thought, because this is super important, okay? They did not look for dinosaurs. They did not study dinosaurs. They were not trying to find them until the 1800s. Yet, we have thousands of years of Bible history that took place before that time. Okay? Now, here's, here's, here's something pretty cool. Now, so, so if dinosaurs lived around men, with, around men and they were in the garden, they would have to still be around. Okay? Is there any evidence of this? Okay? Or is all the evidence that we have of dinosaurs the bones that we find in the ground that paleontologists dig up. All right, first picture. Now, I want to share a little warning. These are, these are some statues, okay? These are some statues from long, long time ago, and the pictures are, get distorted when I put them into the slides. So, so they look, this next one is going to be like a fat one. Oh, don't change it yet. But there's one that looks like it's like a short little stubby thing, but it's really not. It's just bad distorted picture. Okay. So you got this thing. This is, this is from like 300 B.C. This is a statue from 300 B.C. that somebody sculpted. Okay, someone sculpted. So you were either saying that this animal was just something someone dreamed up or made up, or maybe perhaps it's something that had been seen in history. Okay, or, or spoken. Someone told this person about this creature that it, wants to, that it wanted to share about. Go ahead in the next picture. Could it possibly maybe be a, a dinosaur like this? That it was trying to mimic. That the artist was trying to mimic in the statue. We got another one. Next one. This is the one that looks short and stubby. Okay. But it's actually more longer. Okay. But you got this. Another. You see the scales on it? See the scales on this creature? This again was about 2300 2, years ago. This was made. In, the China, in a Chinese dynasty. Okay. 2300 years ago. Okay. And I know this is not going to match up because of the distortion of the picture. But go to the next one. Could it possibly have been... This animal instead. Go back and forth. You can kind of see it a little bit more with, this, with the top of its head. Um, Cindy, go back to the one. Yep. Now go back to the other one. Yep. So you, you see, could it possibly been, uh, could it possibly been, again, just them seeing this? Because this, I mean, this is 2,300 years ago. Way before the 1800s when we started digging bones. How would they know about these creatures if they hadn't been digging up the bones? If no one had been digging up the bones, how could they make these statues 
of animals that are similar to what we look at dinosaurs. But it doesn't stop there. There's countless cave drawings. Countless cave drawings done by ancient people all throughout the world of what I look at and say, man, is that a dinosaur? What is that? Is it this? Oh, wow. Can you go back? Cindy, please. Is it that? Could that be, go to the picture, a brontosaurus? How would these ancient Indians from 22,000 years ago or more know about dinosaurs and know how to draw them on a picture from bones? Because I don't think they were digging up bones and they were, they were putting them all together and making a, like a diet like what we see in museums. I don't think ancient Indians were doing that. Okay? So then how would they be able to paint pictures of dinosaurs on their walls? The only logical explanation is that the only way these primitive cultures are all around the world were able to do this is because they were man lived at the same time as dinosaurs, just as the Bible says. Okay, that's that's the only logical explanation I can come with, but it doesn't end there. I found this really cool painting. Go ahead, right here. See this painting? This painting is from the 1400s. 1400s. It's called um, Saul's Suicide. Saul's Suicide. It's supposed to depict when King Saul died. Did you know that there's a dinosaur in this painting? Can you see it? I can't either. Let me zoom in. Next slide. There they are. Way in the back. You see this army marching? What does that look like they're riding? Now, if you want to, if you want to see some, that, to me, that is clearly like a brontosaurus. That's not a giraffe. That's not anything. But if you want to Google search it and you want to find the skeptics who want to disprove anything that God says, they say, "Oh, that's a camel." I know my same facial expression as well. Okay, that is clearly this animal that we just saw. Go ahead, next slide. It's I'm it. Not sure I understand. Oh, sorry, brontosaurus. Go back. Cindy, sorry. Oh, you can just keep that one on there. That's fine. Okay, so, so we have, we have um, it, it, to me, it definitely looks like a brontosaurus. And this was painted in the 1400s. Again, very much before, very much before any dinosaurs and this exploration of dinosaurs were, really began in the 1800s. Okay, there's also another interesting discovery that human footprints have been found alongside dinosaur tracks in the strata of the Paluxy River during the excavation in 1982. That there are actual human footprints next to dinosaurs fossilized on the ground. Didn't learn that in school, did you? Facts such as this destroy the theory dinosaurs died out millions of years ago. So there's evidence of dinosaurs in artwork and on pottery long before the 1800s, backing biblical truth that they were created alongside of men. But shouldn't we see them in the Bible? Yes, we should see them in the Bible. And we do see them in the Bible. There's 35 times in the Bible it talks about dinosaurs. But again, it doesn't use the word dinosaur because that wasn't invented until 1841. So what word does it use? It uses the word tanum. Okay, tanum, which is translated in the King James Version in 1611 to the word dragon. Dragon. So all the times it says dragon, it's actually a referring to a dinosaur within God's word. Okay, that is, uh, that's why the idea of dragon permeates almost every culture around the world. Every culture has, uh, whether it's Native American, whether it's Chinese, every culture, African tribes, all the cultures have dragon mythologies. How is that possible? When there is no ability for them to pass on stories and stuff, when back in ancient times and stuff like, it's because it was things that they saw, it was things that they witnessed. Look at this Chinese zodiac. I'm sure all of you, when you've eaten at a Chinese buffet or restaurant, they pass out this Chinese zodiac calendar. Do you notice that if you go around all the animals that are around there, they have all these real animals, and there's one animal on there that's a fake animal. What's the one fake on there? The dragon. 
why in the world would they have all real animals and then all of a sudden they have a fake animal on there? That, to me, that doesn't make sense unless perhaps when they made this Chinese zodiac 2,200 years ago, that the dragon was actually an animal that they knew about, an animal that was actually alive when they made all of these animals and made all these zodiac signs and garbage, whatever it is, but whenever they made all that stuff, they picked an animal that was actually around or they had heard about that they wanted to put in there, okay? So there are two more specific dinosaur mentions that I want to go through really fast as I try to wrap up here, okay? First comes from Job chapter, they both come from Job, Job chapter 40. Look now at the, it's called the behemoth, Job chapter 40, if you want to follow along. Job chapter 40, look now at the behemoth, which I made long, long ago with you. He eats grass like an ox. See, now his strength is in his hips, and his power is in his stomach muscles. He moves his tail like a cedar. Okay, a cedar is a gigantic tree. Just want to make sure you understand that. This, uh, the sinews of his thighs are tightly knit. Uh, his bones are like beams of bronze. His ribs are like bars of iron. He is the first of the ways of God. Only he who made him can bring near the sword. Surely the mountains yield food for him, and all the beasts of the field play there. He lies under the lotus tree in, uh, in a covert of reeds and marsh. The lotus trees cover him with their shade. The willows by the brook surround him. Indeed, the rivers may rage, yet it is not Yet he is not disturbed. Okay, so I, I Google searched what is a behemoth. And so we just kind of got this illustration of this humongous creature that eats grass and has, I mean, it's huge and its tail is like a cedar tree and it's so powerful in its hips. And this is what Google tells me that a behemoth is. Have you ever been to the zoo before and seen a hippo's tail? It's a tiny little thing that does this in the back. Okay, it, it's ridiculous. Now, that is a big creature, but it doesn't sound, to me, it does not sound what he's talking about. It talks about, like, a, a, to me, something that lives in a marsh, but it's so big that it, it, when, a, when the, the raging river goes through, what he says, the raging river goes through, it does not disturb the animal. So I think it's more something like this, that has a tail like a cedar, like a tree. Okay, and so this is from Job chapter 40. It goes on. Isaiah talks about a creature, a uh, creature called the Leviathan, which is known as the dragon of the sea. Dragon. Now, we always think of dragon as a fire-breathing dragon, right? A fire-breathing thing. Now, this is, a, this is an animal of the sea, Job 41. Can you catch the Leviathan with a hook or put a, no a noose around its jaw? Can you tie it with a rope through its nose or pierce its jaw with a spike? Will it beg you for mercy and play with... Or, Beg you for mercy to play with. Will merchants try to buy it to sell it in the shops? Will it hide to be hurt by spears or its uh, head uh, by a harpoon? If you lay a hand on it, you will certainly remember the battle that follows. You won't try that again. No, it is useless to try to capture it. The hunter who attempts it will be knocked down. And since no one dares to disturb it, who then can stand up to me? I want to emphasize the Leviathan's limbs and its enormous strength and graceful form. Who can strip off its hide? Who can penetrate its double layer of armor? Who can pry open its jaws for the teeth are terrible? The scales, scales on, it back, on its back are like rows of shields tightly sealed together. They are so close together that no air can get between them. Each scale sticks tight to the next. The inner lock and cannot be penetrated. When it sneezes, it flashes light. Oh. Its eyes are like red dawn. Lightning leaps from its mouth. Flames of fire flash out. Smoke streams from its nostrils like streams from a pot heated over burning, rush, or burning rushes. Its breath would uh, kindle coals or flame shoot from their mouths. The tremendous strength of Leviathan's neck strikes terror wherever it goes. Its flesh is hard and firm and cannot be penetrated. Nothing on earth is its equal. No other creature so fearless. Of all the creatures, it is the proudest. It's the king of the beast. To me, that sounds like a dragon. 
sounds like a dragon, and this is something that God made. This is God talking to Job. Okay, so this is God's word speaking to Job about this dragon dinosaur creature in the water. So, so here's the big question. I'm sure most of you have. What happened to the dinosaurs as I wrap up here? Well, the short answer is the flood. Okay, the flood wiped out all of life except what was on the ark. Then after the flood, the dinosaurs could not flourish because of the change of the atmosphere and the food source. God had destroyed all the food source, and now the culture, or the, the atmosphere had completely changed. Which again, we're going to get into when we do the flood. But all of it changed. There was no more food source. They had to grow from the ground up, all the food source. So there was very limited food source, and the atmosphere was completely different. The climate completely changed after the flood. Pre-flood, there was most likely double the amount of oxygen that there is today. And if you're a brachiosaurus with your neck that's 20 or 30 feet long and your huge nostrils and this huge massive creature, you need tons of oxygen. So how can an animal that size get enough breath in their lungs in order to live? They can't unless there's double the amount of oxygen pressure, which there no longer was that. Also remember before the flood, people lived more, much longer. They lived 900 years old. That's what the Bible tells us, that, that man lived 900 years. And so you can presume and assume that the animal kingdom did the exact same thing. Okay, if man lived to be 900 years, we see animals live longer than us as humans, so we would assume that animals live that long as well, if not longer. And there's a common thing that maybe you didn't know, that many reptiles continue to grow their entire life. So, if a reptile lived, grow, grows the entire time it's alive and it lives over 900 years, how big do you think they would be? I think they'd be as big as the dinosaurs we find in the fossil record. These ginormous creatures, right? Because of how long they lived. But that all would have stopped after the flood. Well, why, if they were on the ark, Pastor Zach, then why, why don't we see them anymore? Okay, well, first of all, God stopped everything from living so long after the ark, which again, we're going to talk about, which includes dinosaurs. So if any dinosaurs that came off the ark would not have the oxygen to grow so big, they would not live as long to continue to grow so long, and they would not have the food source to get so massively huge, right? So they'd be smaller creatures. Okay, so we got these dinosaurs that are now small. What do you think is going to happen to these dinosaurs? You guys know men. What do we do to animals? We go hunt them. Now that they're in our category that we can hunt, we're going to hunt them down. That's why we keep having these animals extinct. We go hunt rhinos. We go hunt bears. We go hunt anything. Big game, right? So what do you think we're going to do to the dinosaurs? That are not as big, that are not as, as strong, not as massive. We're going to go hunt them, eat them. Okay, make them our food source. Okay, but Pastor Zach, the fossil record says that they are millions of years old. I told you countless times, fossil or, or uh, the dating process is not accurate. It's been proven inaccurate countless times. It's an estimation and it's often inaccurate. Have you ever wondered why we don't find fossils everywhere when animals die? Okay, I, I know I have lots of, we have lots of deer hunters here, and I hear countless times, oh, I shot a deer, I couldn't find it. Well, it doesn't mean it didn't die. It died somewhere in the woods. Okay, well, if it doesn't get eaten, its bones don't get eaten, what happens to it? We don't keep finding fossils of thousands and thousands and thousands of animals. All the roadkill and stuff on the side of the road doesn't turn into fossils, right? Why not? Well, if you grew up like I did, you were taught by the state-run school system that you probably have already have a built-in answer that fossilization is a slow process over millions and millions of years. We've learned that when plants and animals die in a wet environment, that eventually they become fossils because the sediment buries them. We probably all had books that showed a fish fall on the bottom of a, bottom of a, a lake or something, and the sediment covered those fish. And then after millions and millions of years, that water would dry up, and then we'd find a fossilized fish underneath the sediment, underneath the, as, as becoming a rock. Okay, We've all got that. We probably all have seen that. And it's millions of years, voila, you have, after millions of years of pressure and pounds and all this stuff, you have a fossil from a dead animal underneath all that sediment. Except when dead fish die, they don't sink. They bloat. They bloat and go to the top of the water. Then they get eaten and they disintegrate. Fish just disintegrate, get eaten as they go down the bottom and they disintegrate. Their bones are very brittle. See, I discovered, when I was, I discovered that I was taught what to think growing up and not how to think. Most people, even Christians, still believe it takes millions of years for rocks to form and living organisms to become a fossil. I never doubted these reasons because growing up, even within the church, 
I was never taught an alternative of the teaching. I was never taught what you're being taught today growing up. No one ever told me about dinosaurs in the Bible growing up. I was just taught scientists are smarter than you, so be quiet and listen. They know the truth. You're too dumb to understand it. Just nod and say yes. I was thought that giant, there was a giant catastrophe that happened to all the dinosaurs. An asteroid hit the earth and, or a super volcano exploded and killed all the dinosaurs. Never once was I taught that the giant catastrophe that killed all the dinosaurs was exactly spoken about in the Bible and lines up perfectly with our fossil records. That the flood was what killed all the dinosaurs. Even though I knew the flood story, no one ever told me that the flood was what killed the dinosaurs. Ever. And I was raised in the church my entire life. It killed everything. The flood killed everything. And it created the circumstances for creatures to be buried completely with flood waters. And buried with mud and sediment. As all that mud, when God said he opened the floodgates and he opened the waters from below, that means all of the dirt and everything would have been raised up. And then all of that dirt, a massive tsunami, a tidal wave of dirt and mud would just cover every animal up. Would cover them all up and cover them and bury them with thousands and thousands of pounds of water and pressure. Creating the perfect atmosphere, the perfect way to preserve fossil, uh, an animal and preserve them into fossilization. And the evidence is there of this catastrophic event that caused the water and, and piling over on these things. Because we found fossils that, like this one of another fish eating another fish that was fossilized. Okay, if we believe that animals just become fossils when they die and they fall down... Okay, this animal must have choked on a fish on its eating while it was eating and died. Or it was covered in mud unexpectedly by a tidal wave of mud and a terrible catastrophic event called the flood burying all the animals. Massive huge animals as God had said in his word. If fossils were made any time an animal dies, wouldn't we find thousands upon millions, quadrillions and trillions and trillions, trillions of fossils? Because there's been a lot of dead animals through all of history. And we don't find trillions and quadrillions. It, it, we don't, we, it, it's not a, we find them, but it's not something like we just dig a hole in the ground. You can go to your backyard and dig a hole, and I bet you won't find a fossil. But I guarantee you an animal had died there. Probably there's not a spot on the earth an animal hasn't died on, okay? So where, why, why not? Because it has to be the perfect situation and circumstance to create a fossil. The perfect condition. Thus explaining why we don't find billions and billions and billions of fossils of every dead creature that's ever died throughout history. It has to be the perfect event. Scientists tell us that it takes millions of years for rocks to develop, but okay, if that's the case, then how do we have this? A clock that is inside of a rock. That's an old clock in Washington that a rock has formed around a clock. If rocks take millions and millions of years to form, then how in the world could this possibly have taken place? It doesn't take millions of years. It takes the right circumstances. The right atmosphere, the right circumstances, the right elements, and then voila, you can have it. Scientists can mimic fossils in 24 hours in laboratories. They have processes where they can make a fossil in 24 hours within a laboratory. It's all about, and the reason why I tell you all this is because the dinosaurs dying perfectly lines up with what the evidence we get from God's word that they were covered by mud and they all died. And then the dinosaurs that were on the ark, that were on the ark, didn't survive. They didn't flourish. They didn't die. They died out like a woolly mammoth died out. They died out like a saber-toothed tiger and the dodo bird and all these other animals that are extinct and all the other ones that we've killed off that are all about to die, the tigers and all the other, you know, you all see the videos. Save the creatures, you know. It's the same process. That's what happened to Isis. So there you go. There's the evidence. Sorry it was super long. Had a, lot, had a lot I wanted to cover. I wanted to do it in one sermon. Okay, but there's all the evidence. The choice of what to believe, though, is up to you. This is the point of this sermon that I want to get across is that God's word is there. But do you believe God's word or do you just want to pick and choose what you want to believe? Oh, I don't know if Pastor Jack, science tells me one thing, but I don't know if I can have a biblical perspective. I don't know if I can have a biblical worldview because science tells me differently. I believe in the carbon dating. I believe in all the things that they talk about because it, it makes more sense. Does it? Or does it make more sense that a designer created all things, left us all the evidence for those things, revealed all those things to us, 
and man doesn't know what in the world they're talking about. And we can look at all throughout history, people, other people that magically know about dinosaurs before we've even started digging up bones. How could they possibly know? Well, it's because they walked with them. It's because they saw them. Or their granddad saw one and told them about it. Okay? That's the only explanation of how we have cave drawings and potteries and all these different things, paintings that predate the 1800s. Okay? When people started putting the dinosaur bones together and putting them in museums. But the choice is always up to you. There's evidence everywhere. There's a famous astro astronomer, Robert Jastrow, that said all the essential elements of the Big Bang Theory line up with biblical creation. And Jastrow is not only a prominent non-Christian scientist, he's not the only prominent non-Christian scientist who states this parallel that of how God works, that God speaks something into existence and creates it, and then science runs and catches up with what God said. They run and catch up with it. Science studies creation. Ben, go ahead and make your way forward, please. Science studies creation and provides the evidence that God left. Also, I mean, I mean just all this evidence is everywhere. There's evidence of the truth of God's masterful work in creation. For instance, you know, if there was just slightly a little more, if gravity was just a little bit more powerful, the universe would collapse into a ball crushing everything. And if gravity was a little bit less powerful, that gravity would, you know, the universe would all fly apart. That everything would just fly apart. The sun, the moon, the stars, everything would fly apart and nothing could exist without the sun, moon, stars, all that stuff, right? So gravity would just, everything would fly apart. Gravity is precisely as strong as it needs to be. And if the ratio was off by just a bit, life could not exist. Science has discovered that because they're catching up with what God did. Doesn't the precision of the universe at least make it logical to conclude that there's a creator who made it precisely the way that he did? Perfect. And told his creation about his, told all of his creation about what he did. The evidence is there for you to believe. But it's not a substitute for faith. Which God tells us is the only way to be saved. By faith alone can you be saved. That you have to believe and have faith. That's the key right there. If you want to have the biblical... I know it's hard sometimes to have a biblical worldview because it's countercultural to what we have out there in this world. That's why God tells us to believe and have faith. Will you believe the truth of his word? Will you believe? Will you believe him? Will you please stand and pray with me?